I was lying on the beach um, uh, on holiday <coughs> reading a book by Nick Davis, who uh, we invited to come and, and talk um, about a month or so ago about, um, uh, and his book was called Flat Earth News. And about the same time, I'd been asked to give a talk at the American Heart Association, and rather than do one on uh, you, why you do large trials, why you do observational studies um, in lots of different countries, um, I thought it would be more interesting, particularly given my uh, um, experiences with the media over the statins, to um, uh, do a talk on uh, how uh, misinformation, or as I put it, disinformation, deliberate misinformation, um, uh, was impacting on, on health. Um, so I, I sent off the title, in fact my original title was Fake News, Death and Disability by Disinformation, to the organisers of the American meeting, uh, and they said, um, fake news, it's kind of a bit sensitive. So I had to come up with um, post-truth <coughs> uh, medicine, so uh, um, that's how I, I got to, to this particular title. Because it was um, uh, in a formal meeting, I felt it was important uh, because it had been raised, actually, uh, in a, a repost by the chief executive of the British Medical Journal when I commented on um, the fact that the BMJ didn't make any of its financial um, disclosures public, um, that they made a big play about the funding from industry. So I felt I should be really quite explicit about uh, the funding on my, my disclosures. Um, and uh, uh, because I had also been pursued by the Sunday Times over a patent for which we receive no money, um, I also thought I ought to make clear exactly what the situation was on that, um, and our policy on uh, uh, honorary consultancies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and finally, of course, I should make, <coughs> make clear that I had argued that the BMJ should retract uh, the papers that it had published because they contained disinformation. So... Uh, Disinformation or, or fake news, I managed to squeeze it in. Um, uh, false information, which is intended to mislead, especially propaganda. Uh, the definition says issued by a, a government organization to a rival power or the media, but uh, I think it goes beyond that. Uh, and post truth, um, in which objective facts are, are less influence, influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief, uh, or if you like, alternative facts. So because I felt that I should not be too direct in America, I thought I would you, give some UK examples of the impact of fake news. Um, uh, and here, of course, is the, the famous <coughs> bus um, from the Brexit debate. Um, and just pointing out that even in September 2017, uh, and indeed probably more recently than that, given Boris Johnson, uh, he was still claiming that this uh, 350 million uh, was going to come back each week uh, for the NHS. Um, I think Theresa May is now picking this one up as well, it seems. Uh, does truth matter? Um, well, yeah, does it, it uh, reduce the value of the pound uh, against the dollar and uh, clearly against the euro, which went down from uh, down to about 1.1? Nearly, nearly at uh, a one-to-one. -one. Um, and uh, they like this in America. Uh, Michael Bloomberg, Brexit is the stupidest thing any country has done beside Trump. Um, so then I thought about, you know, well, moving closer to health, the kind of, the most famous example, um, probably, is the uh, Andrew Wakefield MMR autism claims uh, in The Lancet back in 1998. Uh, when, um, uh, in a press conference or, um, that was organised by The Lancet, along with the publication, uh, he made claims that went beyond uh, the paper. Um, and again, I use this example because when I had raised concerns about statins, I'd said that actually the, mis the disinformation about statins was more important uh, than, uh, in public health terms, than even this MMR autism. Uh, claim. And it provided me with an opportunity to kind of support uh, that particular statement. So in 1998, for those who aren't aware, uh, Andrew Wakefield and a group from the Royal Free Hospital 
uh, of very senior clinicians um, reported that the MMR vaccine is linked to autism. And then in 2002, the BBC television panorama program uh, did a very uh, sympathetic um, uh, TV program uh, supporting that hypothesis. In 2004, 10 of the co-authors of the original paper, as well as the Lancet editor, uh, issued a partial uh, retraction. Uh, and in 2010, so not some 12 years later, the General Medical Council removed Wakefield from the medical register and the Lancet retract the paper uh, for inadequate ethics approval and, con and not having complete conflict of interest disclosures. So what was interesting about that was that they didn't um, uh, retract the paper uh, uh, for um, being fraudulent, for, for, for being misleading. Um, they did it on a technicality. Um, and I was interested as to why they'd done that. So I, I happened to know the QC who had worked for the GMC on this, so I spoke to her. Uh, and I know the Lancet editor, and I tried to speak to him, but he wouldn't talk about it because it was still so painful. Um, so I talked to the editor of another major journal and asked why the paper uh, had been re retracted on this basis. So what's the impact also of not retracting it for scientific misconduct or fraud? Well... I mean, I, I guess I, the answer I got to my question from the QC was really the Al Capone answer. Um, Al Capone was sent to Alcatraz for tax evasion. He was able to convince the jury and the judge that he had nothing to do with murdering people, um, but they managed to get him on income tax evasion because he had such a flashy lifestyle, but um, uh, he hadn't uh, paid much of his tax. Um, and... Uh, uh, he had managed to kind of separate himself from links uh, with, with violence. Al Capone um, uh, died in Alcatraz of syphilis, um, but uh, the impact of withdrawing Wakefield from the GMC was nowhere near uh, as, as severe. Um, and, and I wanted to kind of think about these technicalities, um, uh, and the reason was that to prove that it was fraudulent, whether you are a journal editor um, or whether you are the GMC is really quite difficult because you have to prove it beyond reasonable doubt. Um, and so it was actually easier for them to get him on a technicality that he hadn't um, in the paper uh, disclosed all of his conflicts of interest um, uh, and um, uh, that uh, in particular financial links that Wakefield had. But I think that the problem with this strategy is it leaves people with the belief that the original claims are still true, um, uh, or that at least they haven't been adequately refuted. And so the, the danger of this um, approach is that you uh, don't deal with the underlying uh, problem. So did truth matter in this particular case? Well, uh, it clearly did in terms of the, the vaccination rates. The dotted line uh, is showing the, the kind of levels that are, are usually wanted to um, get herd immunity from um, the MMR vaccination. You can see that they were approaching that uh, before the paper. Uh, they kind of flattened out. Then the paper dropped it. The BBC Panorama TV programme uh, um, was associated with further decline um, and it's only just um, over the last few years got back to, to where it was. So, so clearly it had a public health uh, impact in terms of um, the vaccine rates. And it appears to have been associated also with an increase in uh, measles cases. But the numbers of measles cases across the whole of the UK are relatively small numbers. Um, and at least in the UK, uh, the impact is of uh, measles, which is, is very rarely uh, disabling um, or fatal. 
Now that's not to uh, say it's not important. Um, and in developing countries, uh, the impact of uh, such a, a change in vaccination rates would, in public health terms, be even more important. In the US, there, was, there also appears to be uh, some impact um, with outbreaks in the Amish communities um, and uh, one in, in Disneyland. Um, here there's a, uh, uh, one where they, most of the cases were from France, so suggesting perhaps that there had also been impact uh, in, in other European countries. And because it just didn't get dealt with properly, um, it is still believed uh, by many people. Um, so this is from 2017, February 2017, in the Washington Post, said President Trump has been batting around the idea of having uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, chair a vaccine safety commission. And this picture is from a newspaper at around that time of Robert De Niro, who has a child with autism, uh, and Robert Kennedy Jr., who are offering a $100,000 uh, reward to anyone who can prove vaccines are safe. Uh, and, and Robert De Niro was uh, um, going to show uh, the movie that um, Andrew Wakefield has made uh, about vaccination and about being a victim of the medical um, hierarchy. Uh, in his uh, film festival in New York until uh, pressure was put on to have it withdrawn, which he agreed to do, but he was, he was then quoted as saying that he re wished he hadn't. So th I think the danger of not dealing with this stuff is it th it the, the belief persists that there is a real link. So uh, in a paper in the Journal of Medical Ethics in 2003, uh, the point was made that there's a real danger that two points of view on the same subject will be presented as if they are more or less equal. And uh, here on the, the left, we have the risks after measles. And here on the right, we have the risks after vaccination uh, from a paper uh, that they extracted um, uh, by Duke Lockton Ward in 1998 on drug safety. So indicating that um, the risks of vaccination were far, far lower than the risks um, after measles. And I wanted to come to this kind of point of the issue of, of balance. Um, so here in October 2017 in The Guardian, the BBC apologised over an interview with the climate denier Lord Lawson. Um, they'd initially rejected uh, complaints from listeners um, uh, because they argued that the stance was reflected by the current US administration. Um, uh, and that offering space to dissenting voices was an important aspect of impartiality. Um, so the, the criticism was that they hadn't um, presented the alternative view. And this is where we come back to the, the book Flat Earth News by Nick Davis, because he makes the point that this idea of neutrality, uh, which um, the BBC is very keen on kind of uh, describing, where they say, well, you know, on the one hand we have this view, on the other hand on, on this view. Actually, Nick makes the point that this is really an, an abrogation of responsibility. And he gives a nice example. He says, two men go to mow a meadow. <coughs> one comes back and says, job done. The other says, we never cut a blade of grass. Neutrality would involve merely saying that we don't know what happened, you decide. So that's the BBC view, you know, will tell you two things. One can be true, one can be untrue, you decide. Rather than actually helping people to determine the truth by assessing the available evidence uh, objectively. He also goes on to say you know, how difficult it is to do that, uh, how difficult it is to know what's true, um, and talks about uh, public relations and how public relations groups actually create um, pseudo organizations that pump out information um, uh, that look as if they're independent stories uh, in the media. And that they, um, they sometimes 
are presented as being uh, grassroots organizations, um, which uh, he refers to in the, in the, uh, the, the book as AstroTurf, um, kind of fake grassroots organizations. A and of course, you, the tobacco industry with Forrest in the UK is a good example. Uh, in the US, it was called Get Government Off Our Back, and this was all about you know, freedom uh, of uh, expression, freedom to advertise and, and promote things um, uh, about uh, rights of people to be told how to kill themselves effectively. Um, and when you look at health, you find um, that this is going on as well. So uh, in this paper in the New England Journal in March of last year, 83% of patient advocacy organizations uh, were receiving very substantial funding uh, from industry. Um, and and this, this funding to these organizations was really a major part of their, uh, their funding. And even these estimates, it was suggested, are, were likely to be substantial underestimates because not all of the information uh, was publicly available. Um, and of course, there are ways in which um, funding organizations can channel money uh, so that it gets to the, uh, the, the patient organization um, having been neatly uh, laundered. And Nigel Hawkes in the British Medical Journal uh, commented on this with respect to the statins. Um, he said, an endorsement to the PCSK9 inhibitors funded by their manufacturers. Um, and so the point he makes in this article is that we've got the statins, they're cheap, they're effective, they've been demonstrated to reduce the risk of heart attacks and strokes. Um, so you, given you've got these generic drugs which you cost very little, 10 or 15 pounds per year for a really good, effective uh, generic um, satin. How are you going to sell a new antibody, which you give as an injection, um, which is costing four to 5,000 pounds a year? You create a market. You create a, the statin intolerant market. And if you do a web search, um, for the phrase statin intolerance, then you'll find that it only emerges over the last three or four years. Um, it's been created uh, by, um, it, it appears, um, the industry that needs there to be statin intolerance. And again, in terms of these funding organizations, so the European Atherosclerosis Society and the Canadian Consensus Working Groups that published reports on uh, statin-associated muscle symptoms, statin intolerance, um, were funded by the manufacturers of PCSK9 inhibitors. They've created a PCSK9 forum, which is uh, edited by the co-chairs of that European Atherosclerosis Society report, and managed by a publishing organization or a PR organization, which is funded uh, by the manufacturers of the PCSK9 inhibitors. And the charity Heart UK, which objected to NICE's decision not to endorse the use of PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, is also uh, receiving funding from those manufacturers. Now, that's not to say that, that they have been influenced by this funding, but uh, it is uh, an issue in terms of uh, independence. And indeed, the American College of Cardiology um, developed an app uh, that doctors can handily use with their patients to identify the statin intolerant patients um, uh, to whom you can give um, a PCSK9 inhibitor. Um, uh, and the website uh, states that financial support was provided by Amgen. All of the content was independently developed with no sponsor involvement. However, the people who developed the algorithms that went into this app uh, received funding honoraria consultancy fees uh, from the PCSK9 inhibitor manufacturers. So does that matter? Does it matter in terms of public health? Well, the problem is that you, despite the evidence, um, particularly in secondary prevention, so people who've already uh, had a cardiovascular event, um, uh, so they're high risk, 
for whom the benefits of statins are in absolute terms are very high, where even the BMJ that published the original papers that I suggested should be retracted uh, accept um, benefit from the treatment. The problem is that a large proportion of them uh, are not taking statin therapy. Um, uh, now part of that may be that you, their doctors haven't advised them to take it, but my own experience of going along to my own GP uh, is that um, uh, one gets information from GPs that is actually not encouraging you, but actually discouraging. So when I went to my GP and said, look, you know, at that time I was about 58, I said, I think it's about time my risk will be high enough. I'll have a statin. She said, oh, I can't even get my high-risk patients to take statins because of all the side effects, she said. So I took the statin and changed my GP. But, <laughs> but, but um, you know, the, the problem is that um, there are a lot of high-risk patients who are not uh, taking their treatment. So that was in the US um, back in 2010. Um, and they estimated in that paper that in the US alone, there were you know, five to six million people with coronary disease, another nine million uh, with diabetes, which is often considered to be a, a coronary disease qu equivalent in terms of risk, um, uh, aged over 40 to get that kind of coronary dis disease equivalent, who were not taking statin therapy. So we're talking about you know, 15 million or so individuals in the US alone who are at high risk who are not taking a statin. And the same thing is seen in Europe. These are uh, tables uh, for, um, uh, from Bobby McAleva and, and colleagues uh, across Europe uh, in a number of different countries. I've just um, combined it across those countries. At different ages, you can see in secondary prevention, um, uh, there are more people not taking statin than taking it. And this is work by Emily Banks and her colleagues. Emily was someone who uh, was in the cancer epidemiology unit a, a long time ago and is a visiting professor in the department. Um, and uh, in Australia, uh, they found much the same. Here on the right-hand side, um, around half taking and about half not taking statin and secondary prevention. And then in high-risk um, primary prevention, uh, even uh, lower proportions taking statin. So what's the evidence in terms of benefit versus risk? Well, the benefits are pretty big. So if you take 10,000 people in second prevention, about 1,000 of them over a five-year period um, would avoid uh, having one or more uh, cardiovascular event, a heart attack, a stroke, a revascularization, a vascular death. Um, so about 10% of them would avoid one or more uh, event. Uh, over that five-year period, and if they continued it for 10 years, then the absolute benefits will be about double. In primary prevention, the benefits are about half that. Half that. So if you typically take someone who's got uh, um, um, a secondary prevention, give them a dose of, say, 40 milligrams of a torvastatin, which as I said is about 10 or 15 pounds a year, halve their LDL, you halve their risk or lower their LDL by a couple of millimoles per liter, you halve their risk of these life-threatening or fatal uh, vascular events. And against that, we've got pretty good uh, evidence um, of the harms, about five more myopathy cases. So this is the statin actually causing uh, muscle problems uh, where you get uh, muscle pain, weakness, big increase in the creatine kinase muscle enzyme in the blood, um, and typically large muscles um, either in the arms or, or in the legs. And it's a serious condition. Um, it's important that it's picked up uh, because as soon as you stop the statin, it'll go away. But if you continue, then there is a problem of muscle breakdown uh, going into the kidneys, damaging the, the kidneys. Uh, uh, so-called rhabdomyolysis, so dissolving of the, of the muscle, uh, and uh, you really want to avoid that. But it, what's, what's really nice is that if you stop the drug, it's re it reverses very rapidly. Lowering LDL cholesterol does appear to increase the risk of strokes due to bleeds. 
um, but it decreases very much more substantially in absolute terms uh, the risks of stroke due to, uh, to clots, ischemic strokes. Um, and David Price, uh, working with Navid Sattar, uh, identified um, that um, statins, and indeed it appears lowering LDL through similar mechanisms, uh, produces an increase in the diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, but bear in mind the main concern about diabetes is increase in macrovascular events, so heart attacks, strokes, and of course they are the things that are prevented by statins, and increases in microvascular uh, conditions, so uh, in the eye, in the kidney particularly, um, and very careful studies have been done showing that statins have no adverse effects on the eye uh, and no uh, adverse effects on the kidney um, uh, in long-term chronic use. And if one looks at the kind of intolerance end, the symptomatic adverse events, at most, if you really squeeze it, I think you can say that you know, about 50 to 100 uh, more per 10,000 people over a five-year period uh, may be getting um, symptomatic uh, adverse events. As I say, may, um, I think it's something one has to really uh, to squeeze. And we are now uh, looking at this in great detail. Uh, Kirsty Reith is bringing together all the adverse event data from all the major trials, uh, along with colleagues in the department, to try to work out what the, um, the size of the effect is. So we've got large-scale randomized evidence that tells us these things, and also the evidence that's in the public domain um, really rules out material excesses of any other uh, adverse outcomes. And yet, uh, we get claims like this uh, from Rita Redberg in JAMA. Um, healthy men should not take statins. By taking statins, 20% or more will, in, will experience disabling symptoms, including muscle weakness, fatigue, and memory loss. And the paper that I really took exception to in the BMJ uh, by John Abramson, statin therapy has about an 18% risk of causing side effects that range from minor reversible to serious and irreversible. So where does this 20% come from? It comes from, I think it has to be said, it comes from a willful misinterpretation of a very carefully done study. Uh, this was a, a study done um, uh, by a group in, in Boston, uh, by Zhang et al, uh, where they looked at the reasons in a registry uh, that were given for discontinuation or, of statins. Um, so in that registry of 108,000 people who'd received statins, it was discontinued at least temporarily by about half of them. Um, and for around 20%, the number from the previous slide, statin-related events were recorded um, by the patients. And the statin was then discontinued uh, at least temporarily by about, about half of these. They then went on to say that 92% of the patients who were re-challenged with a statin were still taking the statin. So the re-challenge of those individuals did not um, uh, result in a recurrence of these, uh, these symptoms. Um, and they said in their paper that it supported the hypothesis that many so-called statin-related events in observational studies may not actually be caused by the medications, uh, a statement kind of overlooked um, by uh, Rita Redberg, John Abramson, um, uh, and indeed the BMJ uh, editor. Um, uh, and uh, when they finally decided to make any modification in the BMJ, they said, well, we did get it wrong. It wasn't 17% because only half of them discontinued. It was 9%, um, which was a kind of <laughs> obtuse correction. Um, and John Abramson also, in his paper, referred to a, uh, a survey by N. Haynes uh, on the comparison of muscle uh, reports, observational studies. Now, this is worthwhile having a look at because um, in that uh, paper, they said um, musculoskeletal pain of any severity, so minor or, or more 
uh, severe, occurred in 22% among patients taking statin and 16.5% among patients not taking a statin. So Abramson then said the excess risk of myopathy based on this N. Haynes paper is 100 times greater than that reported in the clinical trials. 53 per 1,000 patients. You can see where the 53 comes from, uh, the 22 minus the 16.7. Uh, so he's taken muscle um, symptoms of any severity and decided to call that myopathy, where myopathy, um, uh, the claim of 5 per 10,000, is based on muscle symptoms with massive increases in creatine kinase, um, a real causal. So he's comparing two different things here, uh, and of course not taking account of the fact that this is an observational study um, where there are potential biases, uh, both with respect to it being non-randomized, but also importantly, that it's non-blinded. So when we compare patients who are taking a statin with those not taking a statin, um, they may well differ uh, um, in many ways. They may be older um, and therefore more likely to have uh, pain, but they're also, they know they're taking a statin. And the ones who are not taking a statin know they're not taking a statin. And one of the first things you do as a doctor when you give a patient a statin is you say, rarely, this drug can cause muscle problems. If, it, if you get muscle problems, come back or check your blood. If you have a big increase in your creatine kinase, uh, then uh, we can just stop the drug. So, uh, and, and as Paul Ridker in Boston uh, says, you, in America you do a second thing. You say, right, take this statin. You might get this muscle problems. Let me know. And also, you should do more exercise. Why don't you go start running? So you take these people who have not been exercising. You get them to go exercising. You give them a drug. You say, this might cause muscle problems. And hey, presto, they come back and tell you that the treatment has caused muscle problems. Uh, so this warning about muscle problems, serious muscle problems, it is likely to generate uh, a, a bias when you compare people who know they're taking a drug with those who are not. What's the evidence for this, this kind of nocebo effect? Uh, well, th there turned out to be a rather nice uh, potential way of looking at this. So this was a trial that we were involved in, run by Peter Seva uh, at Imperial, where they um, randomized, they were actually interested in blood pressure control because they're blood pressure doctors, nothing else matters. Um, but they were comparing two different blood pressure regimens and we managed to persuade them uh, way, way back. Well, at the same time, why don't you do a factorial trial where you randomize again between uh, giving these hypertensive patients statin or placebo. And so good was the statin that halfway through the trial, the data monitoring committee that was reviewing the interim results said, it's clear it's that statin is reducing the risk of cardiovascular events in these hypertension patients. You don't need to go on with that bit of the trial. Uh, you can just um, uh, stop giving them the statin or placebo tablets um, and continue with the blood pressure comparison. So, during that blinded phase, until the data monitoring committee uh, told them about the, the results, um, they recorded uh, all sorts of adverse events. Um, uh, and uh, uh, for this particular paper, um, Peter Sever and his group decided they would look at four um, particular events that had been added to, uh, by the MHRA, the regulator authority, to the data sheet um, uh, that is given to patients one of which was sleep, uh, one of which was um, uh, memory loss, and one of which was, was pain, muscle pain. Uh, now, during the blinded phase, when people didn't know whether or not they were taking the real drug, uh, you can see there is no difference in uh, muscle uh, symptoms between the two groups. Uh, but in the early period, in the first year or so, you see this big increase, because at the beginning, they're being told, take this tablet, it may cause muscle symptoms. They didn't know whether they're taking the real thing or the, the dummy thing, but you can see there's a big increase in the first year, and then it flattens off, but no difference between the two groups. Then they were unblinded. They weren't told what they'd been on previously, um, uh, and they were told you, uh, the results 
for statin were very good, you can then decide whether or not, um, with your doctor, uh, you want to, to take statin. So some of them did, uh, and some of them didn't, uh, and they pretty much took the, the, the statin that was being used in the, in the trial, which was a torvastatin, uh, 10 milligrams. And during that open phase, when they knew which drug they were taking, um, you can see there's a 40% proportional increase um, in uh, the reports of muscle symptoms among those who knew they were taking the active drug versus those who were t not taking the active drug. So when it's blinded, they can't tell the difference. When they're taking the tablets, they know and they attribute muscle symptoms uh, to the drug. So coming back to the sort of the concept of truth matters, um, uh, when the BMJ published its papers in 2013, um, Liam Smith uh, at the London School of Hygiene and colleagues um, uh, decided they would look to see what impact that had had um, on um, uh, statin use. And so they went to the uh, CPRD GP database, which covers about 9 million people in the UK population, um, and looked at what the uh, prescriptions of statins were and also um, uh, in people who were already taking a statin, and they could look at primary and secondary prevention, uh, and also to see whether um, uh, GPs were starting people on statin. Um, and they found a 12% increase in people stopping uh, in the period after uh, the publications of those BMJ papers in October 2013. They also saw a similar reduction in people starting statin therapy, but that was a little bit more complicated because to, um, uh, it wasn't so clear-cut. But the problem there was to, to uh, start a statin, the GPs had to do a risk assessment. Um, and so it was only among the people where they'd done a risk assessment that they could look to see whether there was a reduction in the people who uh, had a sufficient risk on the risk assessment to warrant statins. But there was also a reduction in assessment of risk um, uh, in those practices. So probably uh, things were worse um, than um, suggested just by the 12% increase in people stopping statin. But they go on to say that assuming causality, um, uh, about 200,000 people across the UK would have stopped their statin, and that would translate into about two to 6,000 extra cardiovascular events during the next 10 years. Uh, and contrast that with the measles cases, most of which are mild. Um, I think it is fair to say, assuming causality, that um, the disinformation about statins is at least as severe uh, on public health uh, as the MMR vaccine. And it wasn't just in the UK that this stuff was going on. Um, in Australia, uh, there were two TV programs on ABC TV, The Heart of the Matter and Heart of the Matter, The Cholesterol Drug Wars. And again, our friends Abramson and Redberg uh, were uh, on those programs. Abramson, if you look at overall health, we haven't done anything for them with statins. Do people want to take a statin and trade one cardiovascular event for some serious illness? Or Rita Redberg um, saying essentially twice in this, none of those people who, who get statins are less likely to die by, by taking them. Uh, ABC broadcast the programs in October 2013, and they did withdraw them, uh, whatever that means, uh, in May 2014, because you can still watch them. Um, uh, due to breaches in impartiality standards. That is, they didn't balance disinformation with information. And again, does that matter? Uh, so uh, this uh, was uh, Emily Banks's group again, uh, looked at the impact of those programs on uh, statin discontinuation and uh, dispensing. And they, they saw very clear uh, reduction, uh, sorry, increases in discontinuation and reductions in prescription. Um, and they again said, assuming causality, it was estimated uh, about 60,897 fewer people had statins dispensed than expected. 
if that is maintained, um, that is, they don't resume or they don't start and resume, then between 1,500 and 3,000 preventable and potentially fatal heart attacks and strokes will occur over the next five years. And a, a large part of this problem seems to be a complete lack of understanding of why we do randomized trials. Um, when the October 2013 papers came out, I uh, arranged to go and speak to Fiona Godley, the editor of the BMJ, um, and I, start, I sat down with her and I said, I, I think this is a rather odd way of doing it, but would you mind if I gave you a slide presentation? And I went through about 20 slides trying to explain the evidence, explain why you could um, uh, um, put trust in the randomized evidence and not in the observational studies. But people just don't really understand uh, why we randomize, other than that's the way to get a paper published in a journal. Um, you, not that it's actually the way to find out what's true and what's not. So, you know, observational studies are great if you've got big effects on rare outcomes. Myopathy is a great example. Um, you, myopathy is rare. Uh, this big increase in creatinine kinase associated with muscle symptoms or rhabdomyolysis. Um, it's possible to pick that up in observational studies. That actually, it was picked up largely in randomized trials, but you know, it could have been picked up uh, through uh, registry data. Uh, and you can also use that kind of data to see whether there are big differences uh, between different kinds of people uh, with higher doses uh, or with um, people of different ethnicity. Uh, it's more common uh, at a standard dose uh, in Asians than in Caucasians, for example. So trying to use observational data to detect kind of moderate effects or even quite large effects on common outcomes like muscle symptoms um, is really going to be a problem because of these uh, issues of the differences in the underlying risk of muscle problems in people who do and don't take a treatment uh, and differences, particularly differences with symptomatic outcomes in ascertainment. So really one needs to ignore the non-randomized observational data for looking at these moderate effects and instead focus on the randomized evidence. The randomized evidence has allowed us to look at um, safety concerns, so concerns that have been raised uh, in the long distance past that lowering cholesterol might increase the incidence of cancer, um, and the large randomized trials that have been brought together uh, by the department in the, clinical trial, uh, in the cholesterol treatment trialist collaboration really demonstrated no effect on any particular cancer, uh, and nor in long-term follow-up in several of these trials, uh, any emerging effect on cancer. Despite that, though, um, large observational studies have been published suggesting that statin use prevents cancer. Um, this was published in the New England Journal in 2012, which just goes to show you don't have to randomize if you want to publish in the New England Journal. You can just do observational studies as well, as, as long as they're big. Um, and uh, here you can see uh, it is claimed that um, taking a st statin, any statin, licking a statin even, will reduce your cancer risk by about 15%. Now, you look at this and you think, hang on a second. It increases the risk of cardiovascular events. That's a bit weird. We know from the randomized trials that it lowers it. Um, and of course, the people who get a statin are getting a statin because they're at high risk of cardiovascular events. So this is not surprising. Now, this is a fantastic observational study. It's the whole of the uh, Danish population. So it's comprehensive. They've got detailed information. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't actually have very long duration. It's a couple of years of exposure. So it's not much longer than, it's actually shorter than in the randomized trials. So it's not telling us something about long-term exposure. So you look at that result and any serious epidemiologist will go, I can get that to disappear. I can adjust for various things and then there won't be an increase uh, in cardiovascular events. And that's what they did. Um, uh, but of course, the adjustments you're doing there don't, aren't necessarily the adjustments you'd need to get the right answer for cancer. Um, all you can do is change things so that uh, it looks a little bit more plausible. Um, but it's not real. 
So, you know, m as we all know, the strengths of randomized trials are that they provide reliable evidence, not just about efficacy, but about safety. And it's a bit ridiculous saying that to this audience, but it's so often not thought to be the case. Yeah. Randomization, why do we do it? Produces groups that differ uh, only randomly from each other. So the differences in outcome can be inferred to be causal. Blinded control, why do we do it? Because it allows unbiased uh, ascertainment between the two groups. So differences can be, uh, in event ad identification, as we saw with the ASCOT trial, are applied equally. So that's what we need if we want to assess safety and efficacy on common outcomes. But it, it's not so strange to make those claims when you go out there in the wild. Um, so these are the reasons given for dismissing the randomized blinded evidence about satin effects on muscle symptoms. Uh, pu paper published in 2013 quoted substantially in uh, that BMJ uh, article. So some types of adverse event were not systematically sought or were potentially subject to selective non-response. Well, the idea that you know, randomized trials can't pick up um, adverse effects even if you weren't looking for them is a nonsense. You know, randomized trials are agnostic. They don't care what you think. You know, they just, you just record what happened. Uh, and then if there is a real difference between the people taking the tablets and not, it will emerge. You know, the Thrive trial of a 50-year-old drug, niacin, that we ran, we had no prior belief that it would increase the risk of hospitalization for infection or for bleeding. The data, the trial told us that. Um, uh, it showed that this drug produced these effects in the same way that it would tell us what it did in efficacy. It doesn't care. A randomized trial doesn't care what direction the effects go. It just picks up differences. Um, and none of this had been picked up by observational studies despite 50 years of use of, of niacin. You very widespread use in the US until this trial. The randomized trials, it was claimed in that paper, are usually only powered to detect efficacy and not adequately powered to identify adverse events. Again, a trial is agnostic. It'll pick up an effect on an outcome um, with a particular frequency and a particular difference, irrespective of which direction it goes. And this is the uh, report uh, from David Price with Naveed Sitar that was published in The Lancet in 2010. The individual trials weren't able to demonstrate clearly an effect on diabetes. Um, but when you put together 100,000 randomized trials, uh, there was 80% power to detect uh, the difference that was observed of about 0.5% uh, um, of, of the diagnosis of diabetes. That the randomized trials excluded people who'd previously had problems with statin therapy. Now, this is a bit of a difficult one uh, because most of the large trials uh, that were done were done at a period when statins weren't available they start when they started. So the people hadn't been exposed because they weren't actually on the market. Um, uh, so it would re require an extraordinary prescience from the investigators to know which of them would have problems, having not been exposed to a drug because it wasn't on the market, in order to exclude them. But, you know, this is the thing about alternative facts. They don't have to be true. You know, you can just state them that people uh, at increased risk were excluded. Well, it's certainly true um, that some trials excluded the elderly, some excluded renal impairment, some excluded people who were frail, but then it's also true that some didn't. So here's a trial of very elderly people, uh, mean age was 73, uh, with heart failure, so very frail. Uh, here are the muscle symptoms in that trial, uh, no difference between the groups. They looked at intensity. You no know, clear differences between the groups. Certainly not a 20% absolute increase in myalgia uh, or other muscle-related <coughs> symptoms. That um, the trials very cleverly ran pre-randomization run-ins uh, 
um, in order to identify people who are going to have problems with the drug uh, and uh, excluded them. Perfectly reasonable claim if it had been true. Um, but only a few of the trials actually did have run-ins. Um, most of those used a placebo. So they were trying to find out who is a pain in the neck. And I don't want to randomize because they're not going to be compliant. Not who is going to get pain with, with the drug. Um, and yet, uh, here in September 2016, is the BMJ editor um, being um, cross-examined uh, by um, one of, I think it was Humphreys, on the Today program. And it was fine up to this point, but then he really kind of tried to nail her. And I'm afraid she panicked. Uh, and if you read, listen to the transcript. And she started saying, oh, the risk of elderly people going off their feet, no longer being able to get out of a chair or climb the stairs. The interviewer said, but there have been a tiny number of those cases, haven't there? Oh, no, 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 not at all. I think we haven't really studied them. There haven't been enough of them in the randomized trials. Also, the trials underreport adverse events. And many, many of these statin trials, several of them, there were running periods where people who experienced side effects were excluded. This is three years after I went to talk to her uh, and had quite a lot of correspondence trying to explain this to her. Here is a table showing the major trials. Um, the heart protection study uh, um, and the more recent HOPE 3 trial are the only two of these large-scale trials that used a run-in with statin therapy. There were, the rest of them uh, did not. Um, and actually, it doesn't matter which way you cut it. So you can look at whether or not muscle symptoms were sought specifically, one of the concerns, or not, or whether there was a pre-randomization running with statin, or not. And you can see that the excesses are of the order of 0 to 0.4% over a five-year period, not 20%. Here's the heart protection study with the active run-in. Uh, and you can see, again, as with ASCOT, the impact of telling people uh, that you might get muscle problems at the beginning. You get a big increase early on and in both groups. And then uh, it flattens off, but no clear difference uh, between the groups. Well, this was systematically sought. Um, so the, the kind of claim that you, know, you don't pick it up because you don't seek it, well, the, if you seek it, actually what happens is you get told it. So you get have much higher rates and probably, in fact, systematically seeking something is, is going to make it more difficult uh, <coughs> because you get even more noise uh, rather than just um, uh, letting people volunteer it. And another uh, review, not just of the big trials, but of all placebo-controlled uh, trials, uh, by uh, Thompson and colleagues, uh, published in 2014, came to the same conclusion. If you look at any muscle symptoms, 26 trials, 12.7% versus 12.4%, a difference of about 0.3%. Um, so, you, again, um, no evidence of, of an effect. Um, and they say at the bottom, only three of the 42 studies included in our review used a drug run-in. Actually, they got it wrong. It was, um, two. Um, one of the trials, uh, CARE, that they included didn't actually have uh, an active run-in. But I can understand why they got that wrong, because it wasn't terribly clear in the, in the paper. So kind of concluding, we come back to the benefits versus the harms. The benefits, very big. The harms, well uh, ascertained uh, and very much smaller. Why does that matter? Well, you, it's not down to statins alone. But I think it is down to improvements in cardiovascular uh, treatment um, uh, that in the US and in the UK, we've seen massive reductions in vascular mortality over the last uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, both in men uh, and in women. So, you know, back in the 1970s, about on average, if you average the men and women, about 18% would be dead before the age of 70. Uh, by 2010, 6% uh, uh, dead uh, before the age of 70, a massive uh, change. <coughs> and so this slide from um, uh, Richard, uh, Pito, and Hong Chao Pan, 
um, going up to 2010, really very, very promising. And you just want to see that continuing. But we're not. It's leveling out. Um, so, you know, we've had a lot of progress in the last 20 years. What we need to do is make sure that we don't lose that progress uh, by not using the things we know uh, work. So in conclusion, um, coming back to this thing about uh, um, neutrality, masquerading as objectivity, I think it's completely reasonable. It is completely reasonable. That there should be um, informed debate between differing views across a range of expert interpretations of the evidence. And you, th that is absolutely critical to ensure, ensuring that we really get things straight. But balanced debate requires a consideration of the range of evidence by informed experts. You can't use alternative facts. And the, the danger is that um, whereas people who are constrained by truth, you have trying to fight people who are not in an argument is very difficult. You, so we need to have a set of rules that requires this debate is among people who are constrained by truth. And the idea that somehow you can have a false balance between expert and non-experts, between the flat earthers, the anti-vaxxers, the homeopathists, the statin deniers, I mean, it's just a nonsense. So I kind of concluded, you know, what do we need to do? If we look back at, say, MMR uh, and think how that failed um, in terms of how it was dealt with, what, could, what should we be doing to try to ensure that public health is maintained, improved, um, and deal with um, the flat earthers? Well, I think the medical journal should be more prepared to correct the scientific record, um, and not just when authors agree to retract. So in my conversation with the editor of the New England Journal, he said, you know, the danger is we'll get sued if we retract. So it's much easier for us to persuade the, journal, the, the authors or their institution to retract the paper. The medical and scientific organizations should have processes for rapidly assessing and rebutting misleading claims. And yet, actually, we're seeing the opposite. So the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, only a week or two ago, um, the, the chair of that, uh, along with Asion Monhotra, um, uh, got articles in the Daily Express and the Daily Mail, Daily Mail being the most widely re read UK newspaper, uh, saying that um, n no one had um, lost their life through not taking a statin. Uh, front page uh, news. So we've got the medical organizations are being used to uh, support disinformation. That researchers and clinicians should be more aware of the strengths and weaknesses of different types of evidence. It is remarkable. In discussions I've had, for example, within the Academy of Medical Sciences, that they don't understand the difference between observational evidence and randomized evidence for the evaluation of moderate effects on common outcomes that journalists should not confuse neutrality with balance, and that everyone should consider whether potential interests, financial or otherwise, are leading to misinformation. And by otherwise, I mean that um, one of the people involved in this disinformation on statins was a junior doctor under somebody who I know. Um, and the, he came in to my colleague and said, um, uh, you know, how do I become you know, famous? <laughs> you, as a, he said, well, you know, do research, you publish things that are important, um, you, you make a difference. He said, that'll take too much time. I need to do it now. Um, and this desire for celebrity um, is, I think, also uh, one of the conflicts of interest which really causes problems. Thanks very much.